Buenas tardes, buenas noches. Depende de la parte del mundo que nos estén escuchando. Hemos llegado a la última actividad en vivo de nuestra transmisión. Cinco días seguidos con información para ustedes. Demos, galerías, entrevistas, charlas, mm -hmm. paneles de discusión. Y el último panel de discusión es muy interesante porque hemos tratado uh, tópicos que tienen que ver con la producción de la acuarela, con el mundo interior de los artistas, con los materiales que están relacionados eh, con nosotros pintores para poder realizar nuestros cuadros. Y ahora vamos a tocar un tema muy importante, los espacios para la difusión de esta técnica pictórica los espacios en donde nosotros podemos promover la acuarela, uh, difundirla e incluso... Este, este panel de discusión va a ser moderado por Daniel Bejarano Catalino, ya lo conocen ustedes a través de las entrevistas, y la verdad es que es un excelente conductor. Y tenemos invitados de lujo. Daniel nos hará favor de presentar y yo los dejo en manos de todos ellos. Nada más, antes de continuar, le voy a pedir a mis invitados, algún dispositivo está, tiene sonido prendido, pueden bajarle. Your, yourselves, can you take the... Yeah, ok, it's all ready. Nos vemos en un momento, para una sorpresa, los dejo con Daniel. Bueno, muchas gracias Tere y bienvenida a, a toda la audiencia que nos acompaña. La verdad que tengo el gran honor de hacer el, el cierre de todos los eventos participativos de las charlas y los paneles con este panel de lujo, con unos invitados eh, de lujo. Quiero, quiero tomarme los primeros segundos antes de presentarlos para enviar un, un abrazo fraterno a, a todos mis compatriotas en, en Argentina que estamos en este mismo momento de duelo nacional por la pérdida de nuestro gran eh, ídolo y representante deportivo en la historia, como es nuestro querido Diego Armando Maradona, y bueno, vaya mi, mi saludo fraterno a todos y, y comparto el sentimiento de, de, de esta pérdida de este gran eh, deportista y un patriota, como dijo alguna vez algún periodista en, en alguna de las charlas que vi sobre él. Bueno, ahora sí, vamos a presentar a este panel increíble que me acompaña hoy. Bueno, comienzo con Ángela Barbie. Ángela Barbie es una española nacida en Girona, donde vive actualmente. Desde muy joven comenzó a dibujar y a pintar, y posteriormente recibió clases de dibujo clásico y pintura, y se dedica profesionalmente al mundo de la acuarela desde 1985. También desde ese mismo año gestiona su propia empresa de cursos, EPC Art Cursos en Joy Painting Cataluña, con la que organiza una serie de eventos en España y otros países con los más grandes maestros de la acuarela. Ella ha participado en innumerables exposiciones colectivas e individuales y desde, mil, desde 2013 perdón, fundó IWS Spain y continúa colaborando con esta organización a lo largo de todo el mundo. Bienvenida, Ángela. Nuestra... Siguiente invitada es Paola Espino, ella es mexicana, actualmente es la directora de las carreras de publicidad y ciencias de la comunicación en el Centro de Estudios en Ciencias de la Comunicación en Pedregal, en Ciudad de México, fue coordinadora de Relaciones Públicas del Museo Nacional de la Acuarela Alfredo Guatirrojo por siete años, también coordinó el Circuito Sur de Museos de la Ciudad de México, participó en la organización de exposiciones y eventos en el Museo de la Acuarela y en en otras instituciones, y actualmente sigue participando como juez invitada en concursos de dibujo y pintura. Bienvenida, Paola. Hola, muchas Nuestra, gracias, Daniel. Saludos a todos. Gracias. Nuestro siguiente invitado es Pedja Asimovic. Pedja, junto a su familia, tiene una larga tradición como coleccionistas de arte. Desde 1996, ellos abrieron una galería e iniciaron junto a su padre la tarea de exhibir únicamente acuarelas. En 1999, Pedja se hizo cargo de su galería y desde allí realiza una intensa tarea de promocionar artistas en este medio y organiza exposiciones y bienales internacionales exclusiva de acuarela. Bienvenido, Pedja. Welcome, Pedja. Thank you. Hello. Y nuestro último invitado es Michael Soloviev. Michael es nacido en Rusia en 1972, aunque considera Montreal su hogar desde 2011. 
ha realizado innumerables exposiciones individuales y colectivas por todo el mundo y ha recibido múltiples premios. Recientemente representó a Canadá en gran cantidad de festivales de acuarela, incluyendo Hong Kong, Eslovenia, India, Italia, Francia, Costa Rica, México, Hungría y Portugal. Michael es un verdadero especialista en el manejo de las redes digitales para exhibir su obra y generar actividades artísticas y su aporte aquí va a ser muy valioso. Bienvenido Michael, welcome Michael. Thank you. Ok, bueno, eh, hago una aclaración importante a la audiencia, eh, vamos a iniciar el panel y este panel es exclusivamente en inglés, vamos a hacerlo todo en inglés para que la charla sea más fluida entre todos los participantes, no obstante, pueden dejar sus chats, sus comentarios y sus preguntas en el idioma que quieran, en inglés o en español, en los últimos minutos las vamos a leer y se las vamos a traducir a, a los que no sean hispanohablantes en caso de que aplique. Así que eh, esperamos que lo disfruten. Una vez que este panel haya finalizado, luego va a ser subtitulado y se va a subir a la plataforma de manera subtitulada para que todos puedan disfrutarlo y no se pierdan de nada de lo que hayamos conversado. Bueno, ahora sí vamos a empezar. Ok, let's start. I have a first question and, and I want to start talking about exhibition spaces. Um, what do you think? Are there enough places for exhibit watercolors? What do you think about museums, galleries, alternative spaces, art fairs? I would like to start with Pedja about this topic. Hello, good day, everybody. Uh, like you heard, I do this 25 years. In the last 10 years, uh, uh, I upgrade some things and I start to do with the international artists. And uh, now my opinion is that uh, every of these uh, spaces for exhibitions are very important. Depend of the level uh, which you want to, to reach. So every space has uh, its values. Uh, at the moment, I think that the, the watercolor reach uh, in the world uh, reach one level which is um, uh, at, at the top of of uh, of quality regarding the exhibition that are going on in the world so every exhibition which is only watercolor exhibition i think that we reach the the top level of some of these exhibitions so i think the next stage would be that uh, watercolor artists especially ones that are very good should uh, make a next step and try to exhibit in other galleries which are not uh, specified in watercolor art. So they exhibit together with other techniques in, uh, and in this way, the, the watercolor will reach uh, another level. So it means that the watercolor will be accepted by museums, by Uh, art fairs by famous galleries. Of course, there is a difference between country and country. For example, Mexico is totally different story because Mexico have two museums of watercolor and not so many countries can say something like this. Yeah. So it's very interesting what you mentioned, Peja, because uh, in th that would be a way to upgrade uh, the level of watercolor and watercolor world and in art world in general. Uh, Paola, what do you think about it? Peja mentioned the situation in Mexico specifically. What do you think? Yes, of course I agree with Peja. It's a very important effort to have exhibitions, the quality of the exhibitions nowadays. So I totally agree that both museums, galleries, and other spaces, spaces are very important. I'm very lucky to, be, to have been part of the first watercolor museum in the world. This is the Alfredo Huati Rojo Museum uh, with more than 50 years of experience. As Peja said, in, in Mexico, we have two specialized museums in watercolor. This takes us to a different part, to a different spot of view of, of the view of watercolor. 
what I believe is that these museums and other art museums are taking their view and their paths to open spaces for watercolor in competitions, in temporal exhibitions, in even trying to promote the technique with lessons, classes. So I think both galleries, museums, and also other spaces for watercolor are, are the, making their job to promote art, different ways of art, but especially for watercolor. As I said, I feel lucky to have been in both Mexican watercolor museums, and I've seen really, really great artworks in both of them. And what is experience, Paola, in the museums? But it seems that in in last days, museums are trying to reach people. Not, not in, in the past, museums were uh, places where the people go and, and see and enjoy artworks. And nowadays, because of the mass media, maybe uh, museums and galleries are trying to reach people and, and make, making events to to generate uh, participation from the people. What is the experience of the museums? Uh, there are a lot of visits uh, or few people visit those museums from watercolor specifically. Uh, what I think is that there are both ways. People trying to know more, to reach art, to reach culture, and museums are a perfect place for that. It's not a formal education, but it, it's a very nice complement to go to a museum and learn more and touch and be able, being able to ask and to learn more about any topic. I will concentrate this in, in art museums. As you know, in every country we have uh, a lot of art museums that are very famous, very important, uh, and richness the culture and traditions of every city and every country. But nowadays, I think there are two ways of actions. People trying to reach art to, to, to know more about their culture. And also there is a very big effort from museums to invite new, new people, new groups, new ways to, to simplify this connection to to make more to reach more to develop yeah. more to seduce the the, the public yeah <laughs> maybe <laughs> okay um angela what can you say about it uh, i know that you you've been a jury from uh, contests of painting watercolor paintings are also you send your artwork to galleries or museums what do you think about about places for exhibiting artworks? Um, yes, um, there are, every time there are more places to exhibit compared to, for example, 10 or 15 years ago to exhibit uh, your watercolors. Uh, there are still a few that are specialized or that have uh, the quality of these uh, museum that um, Paola was explaining. But um, I must say that the quality of some of the works exhibited is absolutely fantastic. Not all of them, but it is very good to hire the standards as Peja was explaining and that we can exhibit also in, in other places together with uh, other works. Um, I have participated a couple of times in some fairs in Italy and there it, it's could be a watercolor or it could be any other work. But they were not maybe very high standard, but it's good that uh, we try to make more and more activities. One example I can see in Spain is uh, there is a watercolor museum. Uh, well, it's it belongs to the town hall, but it's in Caudete. It's a small town in, in, in the area more or less between Valencia and Madrid. And they have a, a watercolor museum dedicated to Rafael Requena, who was a, a very important watercolorist. So in this uh, museum, 
what they do, I think, is a very good idea because they uh, organize with the support of the... This is very important that institutions support, I think, because they have the support of the institution and then they organize every year, either one year they organize a competition and the following year they organize like a biennial where very important artists from all over the world are invited. Uh, uh, one Serbian, actually, uh, artist was invited last year, Sasha Marjanovic, and he uh, got a prize. So this generates a lot of interaction between the people in that city and all the people that are visiting. And so you can get together. It's like um, a gathering and uh, that uh, all these activities, these demos, these um, interactions, they promote uh, watercolor a lot. We have also in Girona another watercolor museum called um, Martinez Lozano, dedicated to one of uh, our most famous artists, uh, the Catalan artist Martinez Lozano, also dead. But uh, there we had this uh, symposium of. Um, watercolor associations in Europe uh, in 2015. It was also fabulous, congregating people from many, many countries in Europe. So uh, these are good examples for me of how to, you can promote when you attract the people and there is an interaction. And from there, more and more um, interest uh, can arise. But I think it's essential that the institutions support us. Very nice. Regarding those festivals that uh, I've seen also, what do you think about a watercolor exhibit in every place of the city, inside churches, in the, in the libraries, in the in shops, in galleries, in, in every place? Uh, what, what do you think well, about actually, it? Uh, thank you for mentioning that. I was so lucky to be in Narbonne. It was, I think, I'm not sure if it was 2014. Narbonne is a city similar a bit to Girona. And the whole city was packed. Uh, all the museums were made available. Um, and there were simultaneous exhibitions at the same time. There were uh, conferences. There was the whole city was buzzing with activity. And that was really a great, re great platform. And also in, 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 in Belgium, in Mons, there was also a big, big festival. It was not so general though, but this is the kind of thing that um, for me, my city would be ideal to, to do that. But the institution sadly in Girona, they are more for in favor of a modern art and not so much for traditional watercolor, mm -hmm. which is a pity because traditional yeah. or watercolor in general can yeah. be so powerful and so you can exploit everything. So it's, um, I see if I can have a word with the, with the mayor. <laughs> yeah, as it said, if, if people don't go to museums, let's take the museums to the people or the exactly. artwork to the people. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. We have a flower exhibition every year, and that's exactly what they do, flower arrangements in every public building or even private houses. So imagine doing the same with watercolor. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, Michael, well, it's your turn now. What do you think about uh, exhibition places for watercolor? You have exhibit in many countries around the world. And you also have a strong presence in digital world. So I would like you to speak uh, about it also. So, uh, for now, uh, we are lucky because we have a lot of festivals around the world, which is great, in many different countries. And that's just amazing. But from the second side, just imagine the people, uh, the visitors who go into the, uh, some exhibition, the festivals, that's the people who already like watercolor and interested in that. So that audience is already done. It's growing up, that's great. But idea how to bring more people uh, to interested in watercolor, because a lot of people have no idea what happens with the watercolor world for now. And that's the, uh, for my feeling, it's kind of problem. Because uh, in the regular museums, you almost never find the exhibition in watercolor. 
or mixing media with a watercolor and oil together. So it's still uh, not popular because of the traditional things, or I don't know why, but in fact, uh, it will be just great if the regular museums, we starting to create a watercolor exhibition to bring more people to our audience. That will be uh, from one side, that will be a great idea because people have to know what happens. And that's, that's important. From the second side, we missing, yeah, Mexico is a very, very lucky country. You have uh, two museums, that's just amazing, two watercolor museums. Uh, I know two more countries where we can find it, but normally it's not exist. And uh, so that's impossible to go to the gallery somewhere and all the time find good quality watercolors. Like my students ask me, uh, we're talking about the Alvaro style, for instance. And my students ask me where we can see uh, the Alvaro painting. And I say, I don't know. <laughs> You can go to the internet, yes, but physically have no idea. So it, for my feelings, it's very important to have the places in the country, somewhere in the capitals maybe, with a permanent exhibition with a, a top level watercolor artist, because that helps to, uh, to grow up for people uh, and for the artists to other artists as well, to understand where is the top level is, exists. So that's what we miss in, uh, for my film now, because the internet, yes, that's great stuff, but it's not the same like you can see the, uh, the real artwork physically. That's huge difference, special for the artist because we have to know how it was made, all the touching, all the strikes, how the ink and, and the watercolor pigments moving. That's impossible to see on the screen and texture of the paper. So we have to see it in real. And for my feeling, that's what we, it will be great if you're focusing on that to do it somehow. The permanent exhibitions, museums, for my feeling, each country needs a watercolor museum. That's for sure. That will be just great. Plus the exhibitions in the regular museums, like a, a fine art museums. So that two things, for my feeling, we have to push somehow. Very interesting. Peja, what do you think about selling artworks from, from your uh, artists, for example, that are top watercolor artists, to museums? Uh, museums uh, do museums buy artworks from galleries, watercolors from galleries? Um, or why we can't find uh, water, top watercolor artists in museums? What do you think? Listen, first of all, when I start to go abroad and meet the people who do the watercolor art, I was first very surprised because when I introduce myself, they say, okay, I am, for example, I am Angela Barbie, watercolor artist. Hello, I am Michael Soloviev, watercolor artist. This is first mistake because you are artist or you are not the artist. Yes. Yeah. This is first mistake done by watercolor artist. Second, you must understand when you present your works, in this case watercolor, but you don't say, say it. You present your art, your idea. If you start to present your art in this manner, then the other galleries will look this as an art piece, not as a watercolor. We like to call this watercolor, but then we put this word before. Do you hear somebody say, I'm oil painter? Yes. Did you hear somewhere this? No. So when you start to exhibit, when first of all, a gallery must accept these artists as an artist, not as a watercolor artist. When for, uh, the good ones, first of all, must, in my opinion, they must erase word master. Master, the judge of this will be art history. In 50 years, in 100 years, somebody should say, this artist was a master. Today, we have 1,000 artists, 1,000 
people call themselves, I am a master of watercolor. So first of all, we must be humble to do what we do the best. And we have obligation, not uh, regarding the money or the glory or the, if you start to paint, you paint because you have some needs. And then when you enter the gallery and after the galleries, if the galleries represent you well, then there is a good chance that in the art fairs, uh, curators of a museum go in these very important fairs and they buy the pieces for the museums. This is the, the way how most of the museums do. So for example, you have Art Basel, the biggest contemporary art fair in the world. It happened in Basel in Switzerland, in Miami in America, and, and in Hong Kong, uh, but in, in a year, three times in a different period. So I saw with my own eye, eyes, the curators come to the galleries and they buy artworks for their collections. So Very first of all, good artist must understand that uh, if you are selling good, this not, does not mean that this is a good art. This is first, could be, but not necessary. Second, they have obligation to students, to public, to themselves, to become better and better, to compete, but not, not to com compete in a, in a sense of money or sense of glory, to compete in, 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 in a matter of quality. And there, the, the museum have the, the last point of this story because museum is the highest level of the culture, of the value of some works, not value in money, but value in as a standard. Cultural value, a cultural value. Yeah. So when we reach the museums, then we have conf confirmation of value of some artwork. In this case, done in watercolor technique. Very interesting, very, very interesting. Do you agree with Peja Paola and when you have worked in museums, in watercolor museums, do the curators of the museum go to art fairs and, and buy art for their collection there? Or how was uh, that, that they do? Not really. That's not exactly how it, how it happens. The Watercolor Museum in Mexico City organizes big exhibitions, international exhibitions, locals, contests, and all kind of events during a year. When a big exhibition, such as a Biennial, such as a, I don't know, international exhibition comes to the city, or uh, an exhibition from a, a great artist, a master, uh, is exhibit, exhibited, uh, the museum asks for a donation, not in money, but an artwork. And these may sound uh, different for Peja, but it's a win-win situation. The artist or the group has a, a, an important piece in an important museum that develops its career and their, their track. And the museum uh, expands its collection. So it's a benefit for both parts. That's how I was uh, uh, how, how it worked when I was there, Peja. One question, for yes. example, yes, yes. when you work for the museum, did you ever go to represent or to promote watercolor art in some other museum or some other art fair or not as profitable uh, organization as of a course. promoter of watercolor? Of course. We, we at, at the museum, we had uh, events with institutions, other museums, universities. I, I will say that's another uh, sector, another part where exhibitions can be important to reach uh, younger people as students, as kids, and, and you can invite them to know about art as 
as you were saying before, the importance of being in touch and being able to contact with art. It, in addition, this kind of expression is watercolor and it has its own style and, and benefits. But I would say, yes, the, the museums are willing to, to promote and to develop. So they are doing exchanges between museums and with other institutions. Yes. Very interesting, this, this topic. Angela, uh, regarding, uh, you, you have been in contact with a lot of masters um, and, and they also uh, have uh, portfolios. What, what do you think and uh, how does an artist uh, should prepare a portfolio for showing her uh, the work or to sending their work to galleries or? Uh, I, I couldn't, <clears throat> excuse me, I couldn't hear the last Would part you of your question. The voice, there was a problem with the voice. Yes. Can you hear the last part of the question, please? Okay, I, I can repeat. <laughs> yes, yes, I can repeat. Uh, I was uh, trying to ask how uh, artists should prepare their portfolios uh, how do great artists do to show their work? They have uh, web pages, they have a, a, a folder with their artworks. How uh, do you think that they should prepare their portfolios or how do the, the great masters that you know, uh, they do their, their portfolios to show their work? Well, um... I don't know about um, all the artists, but some of the artists that are very that have very high standards normally are not concerned about uh, showing their work because it. Uh, I mean, about preparing a portfolio. They have a website normally, but it's surprising to see how um, little they care sometimes about. Uh, these digital media because uh, they, it's like the art speaks for themselves and they are looked for uh, at but this is at a very high level they get invitations from uh, China sometimes or from other places to participate and and that, that's where they display their work for us more normal mortals, no? Uh, then if in this case, it is very essential to have a digital presence, I think. And the more digital presence you have, the more you are seen, because it doesn't matter also, unless you are very, very well known, uh, or you have a very high standard. If you are good, or you, you have a lot uh, to offer or you are passionate about what you do and you are proficient and you work hard at it, but nobody can see you, of course, then um, it, is, it is difficult. Yeah, impossible, yes. So yes, some digital presence, but it doesn't mean that somebody, as Peter said before, uh, somebody that has a big presence, it doesn't mean, and somebody that sells a lot doesn't, yeah at a lot of quality. So I, I think that it's more important to concentrate in your art and really get better. And yeah. uh, not so much, uh, how much can no I showing. say? Okay, I am trying to connect the dots because Peja said I, we have to reach the museums, the, the top cultural uh, high standard. Uh, then he mentioned that um, curators buy work. Uh, Paola mentioned museum organized contest. And Paola, you, you have uh, questions. Uh, really? You have a question? Yes, I wanted to, to ask or, or to try to connect with Angela. Uh, I'm sure Michael can add something more, but what I can see as, is that artists are doing two jobs. One is painting beautiful, it's painting every time better, and they are concentrating in their artworks, but they are also doing someone else's job. That is 
promote being the manager, them. being the, the contact with institutions. So it takes the individual artist to do both parts in, an, in a different place, in an ideal world. Uh, every artist could have a manager, like an artist, like a rock star who has a, a manager who can Listen, feel the Listen, artists, they have wives. They do <laughs> the work for them. <laughs> really. That's a yes. perfect answer, Angela. Thank you. <laughs> Michael, Michael, what can you say? Or about they it? have managers like Pidja. <laughs> yes, I, sure. I can sure. tell you um, a funny story um, about that uh, to explain how it works. It was uh, around uh, five years ago. Uh, I went to the very famous gallery here in, in, in Canada uh, to meet the owner, to make the deal, to sell my art. And before we start to talk, uh, he say, uh, okay, what's your name? And take my name in Google. And a few first pages, like three, four pages, was my name with the artwork. And he said, okay, I'm going to work with you. He didn't read my, uh, what I did, my background, nothing. He just checked the Google. And after that, I understood the right answer. Uh, if you want to promote yourself, sell the art, being that like in the business, it's not that uh, we're talking, not talking about the art, it's the business. It's a different part of the artist's life. So uh, you have to focus in on that. So from one side, you uh, really like an artist, you're working like an artist. From the second side, uh, you're a showman. You spend uh, a lot of time to, uh, to work uh, for the social media. And plus, it's the, like uh, you, everybody have to understand the audience uh, in the Facebook and the Instagram, yeah. YouTube, they're different. So sometimes and cross. If you see the same names in the Instagram, in the Facebook and the YouTube, it's because that's your friends, the artists, and they trying to promote themselves in the different social medias. But uh, normally, normal people stuck on something one side, like someone prefer Instagram and they're there. And watching, I mean, we're talking about the watching, just watching and some of them using more Facebook. And sometimes the, this audience cross, sometimes mostly not. So if you want to grow up, you're like a part of the business in art business, you have to use all of them. And unfortunately, that's take like a half of your life. And that's terrible, by the way. Before life was more easy compared to now. From one side. From the second side, it's very... Uh, easy to find the answers and check what people are doing around you. Yeah. One question, Michael. Sure. When you come to Canada, you mentioned this gallery. This was the first gallery where you go with your work or not? Uh, good question. No. <laughs> no, it, it wasn't first, but I did the same. Uh, by the way, I opened the Google and tape the names of the, the galleries <laughs> in the Canada and found the top 10 galleries. And that's how I'm starting to work. So yes, absolutely. That's like a mirror. So my question to the, to the masters, for example, like you say, Michael, we are in one circle who is interesting in watercolor, okay? Yes. And this circle, in, in a year will be a little bit bigger or smaller, but this is this circle, okay? That's right. So your obligation as an artist is to knock on 20 doors and to save the owners of the galleries that your art is good. Never mind how many times you will be rejected. Your obligation is to try again and again. So this Absolutely is Absolutely agree. Yes. This is the way how it should be because many good galleries they are also closed balloons. You you cannot enter so easily in this, you know? Absolutely true. That's very closed world and it's very hard to enter inside. That's for sure. But we have to try again and again and again. Yes. Of course. Of course. 
This okay. is very important. We, we have talked uh, a lot about uh, internet presence, uh, what I think that in, in today's world is very important. Uh, we have some questions. I would like to, to mention some of them. There's a lot of chat in our, in our chat room in, in between people who are listening to you. And one of the questions that I see is, what makes that an artwork raise uh, its value in time? What, what do you think about the value on, of an artwork and how it evolves in time? Yeah. Everyone can answer this one. Okay, first me. Uh, this uh, answer to this question is very complex. There is many, many things uh, which will influence of the value of some work. Uh, for example, if the artist is living artist, he must do all these things, what Michael said during the time, promote uh, himself, his work. Then if he has a gallery, the galleries must do the same. Then after the death of this artist, depends of his uh, work range, if somebody else take to, to, to work on this, uh, on his opus and uh, give another view on his art, then this art can be read over and over again. So like you do the watercolor, if the watercolor have five layers, then it can be become more rich, understand? The same is with the value. If somebody is working on, on, uh, on some, for example, we, we take Michael, if he is doing now for himself, now he finds the gallerist who will do this for him. After he's, he passed away, if uh, art historian took to make interest of his work and start all over the, again to make a story about his artwork, this will become more value. So it's now basically can... a chance. You mean that it's, it's just by chance, no? No, oh, by chance. There is a people who follow many things in the world. They, they are uh, educated for this. For example, in Serbia, we have artists that can, I, I, and I think it's the same in the world, because many confuse the value, his good selling and value, okay? So during his lifetime, he create a very good story and uh, pump the prices, uh, become very famous. But after his death, his artwork is nowhere. On the map of art of the history, he does not exist anymore because it was not realistic. Okay. Okay, maybe uh, history can give the credit, uh, as you said. And okay, yeah, but that, that depends on time. Time. You do the best, for example, you do this interview, the best you can do it. The, the others will judge. Yeah. So. Yes. When you do the artwork, you don't question, oh, will this like to these people or not? You do the best you, yeah. you think you do. So after the, the time will say. The time will judge. Okay. And, and what about um, putting a price to your artwork uh, right now or in the moment that you show an artwork uh, and in this time? How do you, for example, Michael or... Angela, because you both are painters, mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you put the, the price or the value to your artwork? Okay, uh, we have a two uh, sides of that problem. Uh, here in United States and in Canada, if you're starting to work with the galleries, uh, that's very simple solution. Each artist have a price for the square inch. That's it. Well, so, yeah. yeah, that's simple. So it doesn't matter how long you make that painting. Maybe you spend a week, maybe just one hour. It doesn't matter. It's just price for your square inch. And each year, uh, the galleries and the artists uh, change the deal. If I'm growing up, if I move myself, if I'm continuing to paint and make it better and better, my price growing up as well. 
If not, we can keep the same price or going down. So it's changed all the time. That's from one side. That's part of the this business here in the United States and Canada. Uh, from the second side, uh, me, I decide simple. Uh, I put the price like that. Uh, how much my artwork uh, should cost if I will be happy to put it down? Just move it. If, uh, if yes, if I feel how sad, do I, need I put the price higher. And if I feel good, no problem. <laughs> if I feel uh, sorry about what I miss that artwork, I prefer to keep it and not sell. So that's how I adjust personally my price. So from one side, we make a deal with the galleries and that's very important here. I have to keep uh, public, I have to keep that price because if my artwork possible to find with a lower price or higher price, the gallery have a problem. So we have to keep the same level everywhere. Of course. So that's that's important part. That is a fair play, yes. Yeah. Uh, and you, Angela? Um, I don't have as much experience as Michael in galleries, but um, I think uh, this is this is very right. I, I agree with him, and that you should keep the same standard of price. And sometimes the factor of scarcity is very important. So if you remove all these uh, bigger presence, then uh, your art gets valued more. You don't have to to have uh, works everywhere or Sometimes um, just uh, you, it, it also depends on how much you value it, because if, if you value it too high, it's also a problem uh, if you price it too high. But if you really appreciate it, um, then uh, it's also a question of demand. You know, some, some masters, for example, that I've known, uh, big masters, uh, they they sold their work uh, here in, in workshops for a relatively uh, acceptable price, but um, it depends if they are in very very big demand. All of all of a sudden, they 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 raise the price, and that's fair enough. You know, it was just before they they did it like out of their good heart, but uh, if they can sell because in some places they sell very, very high prices um, for their art. So that's that's how they, they, they raise the price. I didn't know anything about this square inch, but um, it's, it's uh, yes, it depends on, on the countries, how they sell it. Also, in the, if you win a prize, for example, I know an artist, that um, uh, participated in a competition and he won the first prize. And the price, it was in America. So the price he had given was uh, much lower than the general prices. And as soon as he won a prize, then immediately it raised the, the, his prices. Yeah, that because would be a you, good you can to, see, to, yes, to raise I, the price, yes. Yes, and and now when he when he presents his paintings, he always asks for a higher price because the standard there is higher, and he may be able to get it. So that's also how he started. Let's say I'm I'm just saying I don't know, but let's say he started with one thousand euro. Now he can get four times more, and that's also the it's the same artist, you know. But if there is not a demand, sometimes you need an external um, uh, like uh, recognition of a price is the same art is the same work of art but oh yes it was first price here the first price there or it got an honorable mention or whatever yes of course that makes you uh, going going further in your artistic career okay i, I want to say that this uh, panel is very very interesting and the time is flying now we are now in our uh, last minutes so i i would like to ask you to to give some words to, to artists and to people that are listening to you. Uh, I would like just a few minutes from everyone to, to say it to the, our audience, okay? Let's start. Spontaneously? Spontaneous. I yes, can spontaneously, I yeah. I don't know if it's okay. a very, um, uh, maybe a romantic view, but sometimes uh, I feel that if you, uh, are concerned about uh, some practical and external things 
um, you're a, a bit missing the point because if you are an artist, the art is exactly inside of you. It's a need, it's an urgency, it's something that you, you, you feel in your life. And like, um, if you ask yourself, could I live without it? Then if you couldn't live because it makes sense of, of you, then you have to continue. And whatever happens, you might have difficult times, but then don't worry so much about uh, all the external things because for me, if you are fulfilling your life, if this is your life uh, to the full and your life purpose, it will happen. That is what uh, is my perception. Thank yes, you, agree. thank you, Angela. Very nice words. Michael? I agree, uh, because uh, maybe you will be, uh, it will be success, maybe not, but it's possible just in one case. If you enjoy what you do and if you like to do that, if you're happy to paint, maybe uh, you'll be uh, lucky and you'll be success. But without that, even if you're a master, it's not just the business at much more. So uh, it's not doesn't make sense to focus in on that. More interesting, just enjoying the process. That's number one. Very nice one. Thank you, Michael. Paola? Yes, I, I wanted to say to artists that those who are not artists, like myself, we also enjoy your job, your work, your artworks. So I'm happy to say that we can recognize good artworks and we can recognize when you are enjoying it and when you are doing it by pleasure and, and doing your best. So thank you for that effort. Thank you for sharing not only your talent, but your heart. Thank you. Thank and you. I wanted to add that being part of groups, associations, museums, or art community is a very big door and it's a, a, the right way to know more, to know masters, to be in contact with them, and to, to learn and appreciate more art and culture. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And Petra, your last words to artists? Just uh, to be sincere, I have no answer to this question because uh, when artists ask me, is this good? If I have connection with this work, I said it's good. I cannot explain why, but I always go with the feeling. So it must be personal for the viewer and for the artist. If you copy somebody, it is never yours because this energy will not go out of this painting because it is not your energy. That's very it. good. Very good words. Well, I, I must uh, give an enormous thank you to every one of you. It's been a pleasure. It's been an honor to be with you in this final panel of discussion. And I'm, I'm very grateful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and we you. are very grateful for your lovely guidance. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Peja. Thank you, Paola. Thank well, you. It's a, a great to, honor. Have, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say goodbye to you, but I must say because we have to continue with a surprise for to all of our audience. So thank you again, and we will see you soon. Bye. Bye. -bye. See you soon. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye to Bye. everyone. Bye. It was